here is part two of our passive solar greenhouse with round pole timbers. It uh, does not look dramatically different from the first video, but believe it or not, I probably clocked around 16 hours of uh, pretty intense labor to get to this point. And in this video, what I'd like to do is explain what, uh, where things are, how it's evolving, some design uh, challenges that I'm perceiving and that I need to think through and uh, share some notes with folks. If you haven't seen the first video, I'm going to link to it right here and that will give more of an introduction, uh, but I'll get into the details of this and show folks what we're up to. So the biggest aspect here clearly is the roofing is on. And I want to say in the last video I got so much thoughtful feedback, thank you so much, uh, with all sorts of different suggestions and different types of resources to look into. And believe it or not, I, every link that people put to the Solex and the triple wall and all these different things, I checked them out and um, came full circle back to the tough text material, which is what I'm using up here for a couple of reasons. It, in total, the roofing material uh, cost me around $300 and then maybe $50 in screws and other elements. And I've worked with this material before on a few projects and it's just performed beautifully for me. And I think at this shallow of a pitch with such a complex roof, I needed a material that was going to be a little bit flexible, which the double wall polycarbonate didn't seem like it would be. And the Solex material seemed too flexible and a little bit complex to try to figure out how to adhere it to such a shallow pitch. Let me go up on the roof and show you uh, how this is looking. So overall I'm really pleased uh, considering the whole underlying skeleton of this are hand harvested and split, you know, completely irregular black locust and then hand harvested and peeled ash. In fact, you look at one right in front of me and this has got a whole lot of squirrel to it. Uh, but the fun part is that if you take a tree and you turn it slowly and steadily, there's generally a plane about which it's relatively flat. And so that's what I did with each of these is um, got them up and on and laid them out in a way and turned them until they were flat and then made a little bit of a recess on the receiving headers, which are these poles here, just a tiny bit of a divot with the chainsaw to receive and cup it, and then pre-drilled and used the timber lock screws to really sink those rafter members down and on. And by eyeballing it as I went and using a reference stick that was uh, quite flat, I used a piece of uh, plywood to make sure that ideally I was forming as close to a plane as possible. That seemed to work quite nicely. Uh, so now I'm chipping away at concurrently adding in the angle bracing. Was this racking bracing? I really don't know my terms. Um, using again the chainsaw a little bit to make some recesses and chiseling out a little bit here or there and then using the timber lock. If you get anywhere near these you can see how I mean, I shouldn't be showing that. If you know what you're doing, you're looking at this and shaking your head. If you've never made a building before, maybe this seems good. It's all a learning process, and what I'm finding is that where I'm not incredibly accurate and tight and wonderfully executing the project, I can just go with stronger members and stronger screws. It's inelegant, but it's functional and allows me to move forward. So the next phase with this is to add in more of these angle braces at each of the corners. But now that all the rafters are on, these purlins are on, and for those of you that are questioning this, the angle is a very low pitch. And you might say, well, that's, you know, even in a northern climate, you've got a lot of snow load. The test that I did with this is basically used it like a jungle gym and if my 190 pound body can bounce and swing from not only the rafters but also the black locust purlins, which I took from uh, offcuts from a local lumber mill and ran through my, my table saw, I can bounce around on all of that, then this Tough Tech should be able to handle that as well. So the manufacturer recommends three feet of spacing bes between receiving members to hold this material and I gave it two feet in most directions and in fact the end caps here this will be a uh, discussion for another video but 
uh, this last bit here, I will be most likely trimming off this excess and putting on a gutter system. But until I know what that looks like, I'm just leaving that excess for now. Um, but once we got to this part, I could go through and when that last purlin was on, which is only a 12 inch spacing, so it's really stout in that last home stretch, um, I went through with the electric saw and trimmed off the excess so it was dead flush using the board instead of snapping a line to it. It actually works out quite nicely. But in some ways it's over-engineered as far as the supports for this roof. Um, so I'm pleased to have that on. There's still some details to finish on the west end there. So now the biggest questions are, uh, design-wise, what to do with these gaps here. And you probably were saying to yourself, there's ridiculous that you would leave a gap like this and what's going on at the top up there? Well, the reason for this is basically I wanted to challenge myself, but also from a uh, safety standpoint, not have this structure be coupled directly physically to the home. As a standalone structure, I don't have to worry as much about asking permission and licensing and all, you know, legal issues. So it's truly standing alone. It's uh, this last section in here, my plan is to put good, sturdy, black locust um, dimensional lumber on this side and on this side. The house is kind of beat up over here anyway, so I want to cover that and put a baseline of hardware cloth from the ground all the way up to the top on our east side here and the west side. And then for the cold months, have polycarbonate, like the roofing, that mounts onto this to seal it, to air seal it. And then once we get into the warm months, because now the roof is fully clear, it's gonna accumulate a ridiculous amount of heat if we don't allow it to ventilate actively. With the polycarbonate off for the summer, there's a huge air gap between the structure and the home, so it decouples it. Moisture and hot air can sneak through before it would enter into the home. That's my hope with this. As far as this roof line up here, uh, right now I have it where it's just in contact under slight pressure, and I need to think through what I don't want to do is actually run screws through the tough text into the house. So right now it's just resting up against it. I might put the foam closure strips back in there to make an air seal, but for now I'd like to leave it and just see how that performs. That's something I can make adjustments to later. So the main structural members are in place, the roofing is in place and feeling pretty good, and now the next phase, phase three, will be to think through how the south the east and the west behind me, how that all gets framed out and how I can include the double pane, huge door panels and window panels that I got with my friend Juan from a house being demolished. I also need to finish up the angle bracing in all these corners to make sure this is as sturdy as possible. Uh, each time I add another angle brace or another element, the structure feels more and more rigid, so that's good. Um, but then my thoughts now are how do we mount these windows and elements onto here, which would be fun to figure out. I'm leaning towards trying to figure out a way of mounting them along the top so that they almost hang down with some support at the bottom, but that they can move a little bit as ground may or may not contract and expand with freezing or if there's shifting that happens. I don't know that I necessarily want huge panes of glass being rigidly locked into a structure that may have some flex. So that'll be fun to figure out. Phase four is going to be how do we design and lay out permanent raised beds in here. My friend Jonathan Bates came by uh, the other day and looked at this space with me and shared notes about his climate battery system that he made in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And by the way, Jonathan is a really knowledgeable guy. Check out his channel, uh, Food Forest Farm. Pretty wonderful videos there. He's just getting that up and running, but check it out and subscribe if you're interested. Um, so that's the next phase, and then we should have this ready to actually occupy with some plants. Certainly a lot more to be done, 
west end roof finished up, all of the glazing, but the basic structure and the basic feel of it is there. And so I'm excited so far how it's working. Still feel really great about the fact that all of the wooden members uh, were under like five dollars in total and they're also really freaking strong. Probably about thirty dollars in timberlock screws, probably twenty dollars in PGP screws for the purlins and the details, and then maybe three hundred and fifty dollars for the roofing. That's our biggest expense on this. We're at around, well, over 400, but not by much. The rest of the structure should cost less than 50 uh, since all the windows were scavenged. But we'll see how all that evolves. Stay tuned for part three. And thanks again for all your input on the, the last video. If you haven't checked that out, please do. There's so many interesting suggestions. People sharing photos and videos of their high tunnels and their greenhouses, just a lot of really thoughtful discussion. This feels like a really exciting community to be part of. So thank you for joining us on this process. And we look forward to sharing the next phase in the next few days.